Hey, um, all right, so I was getting a few questions about um, the Bernoulli principle, which um, I posted a video about yesterday, I think. It's pretty short, about five minutes, so take a look at that. And then really quickly, I wanna also show you That was too hot. <laughs> I wanted to show you how it works in um, in the body as well, in the in the larynx. Dang, that was just came out of the coffee pot, so that was uh, pretty painful. And oh, <laughs> this is leftover from my in-person class, but there are a lot of teeth on this picture, and it is creepy to me. Okay, so if you think about an air molecule. It's got this pretty constant pressure that it's kind of exerting in every different direction. One molecule is obviously not exerting all of these pressures because uh, it can only kind of be, you know, moving in one way at one time. But um, as a whole, like if you if you think of a box, right, and there's air inside the box, every molecule is kind of moving randomly, right? It's just like it's chaos, right? And so the molecules are kind of moving in uh, whatever direction. Um, trying to diffuse, right? So one thing, and it's been a while since you've taken physics, one of the things that's going on is molecules are trying to be as spread out as possible, right? So they're trying to diffuse throughout um, whatever they're in. A room, uh, this box that we're thinking of, the larynx, the, or, you know, below the uh, glottal opening. If you've got it closed, that would be a closed-in system, so the air wants to be diffused throughout there as well. So whatever chamber it's in, air wants to be diffused throughout. Um, and it just kind of moves and bounces around until it is spread out. So you can think of it, I mean again, each individual molecule is kind of only going in one direction at one time, but as a whole there's random forces in all different directions. This is only two dimensions, but you can think about it in like three dimensions as well. They are moving around in all the different configurations that they could just to stay apart. So here's multiple molecules kind of staying apart by moving in random directions. As soon as they make contact with another one or the, you know, the field, the electrical field of another one, they'll move apart and they just kind of keep moving back and forth all the time. Um, and then once we have a vacuum, so that's what's going on here. So we've taken one of these molecules away. Pop. There it goes. Now, oh, can you not? Well, yeah, you can see it not being there. Anyway, I forgot where my face is on this thing. So this molecule is going to go away. Nice Thanos snap. Makes it disappear. And now you've got a vacuum over here in this portion of this box, right? So what's gonna happen is there's a greater amount of movement towards the vacuum. So if you measure the molecules that are next to that vacuum or that open space, they're going to move as a whole. Again, this is kind of, it's representing multiple molecules even though it looks like one. As a whole, they're gonna be moving towards that vacuum space. So there's more of a movement in that area. What that means is that they're actually exerting less pressure on all the other directions um, because most of them are moving towards the vacuum. So now we've increased pressure this way because everything's moving that way and decreased pressure in every other direction than those molecules are moving. Okay, so if you don't know that air is a fluid, it is. So fluid dynamics work the same way with uh, water that you probably saw in the video that I posted before where I blew water at my uh, whiteboard over there. I've, I kept them up. They look like cool modern art pictures. I don't think you can see them though. Anyway, um, so it works with water and it works with air as well because air is a fluid. So you can see um, this is modeling how a football flies through the air. It's in a water chamber with these little uh, kind of glowing uh, pigments in the water as well to model what the air does. But because air and water are both fluids, you can throw a football into a water chamber and figure out what the air does around it.
Um, so this is looking at a different kind of how good spirals fly through the air. It's a cool video. You can look it up if you're interested. Um, and then this is just showing what happens with uh, drag coefficients on airplanes when the landing gear comes down. So it's showing that you know there's not a lot of drag on the actual surface of the airplane because it's like a nice you know teardrop shape that's going to fly through the air really well. As soon as you put the landing gear down, things get nuts. So the whole purpose of this slide was just to convince you that air is a fluid too. So it'll work the same way that the water did in that Bernoulli video. You can think of this as just like blowing through one straw. Here's a straw. So nothing else is attached, you're just <laughs> blowing through the straw. So what's going on is at a constant pressure in a vessel of a constant size, uh, air is going to move at a constant rate and it's going to have a constant forward pressure. Right, so we've got a bunch of different air molecules inside this straw. And because I'm blowing in this direction, most of them are moving this way. There's a little bit of movement up and down. There's not a lot of movement backwards. So if you look at as a whole, again, like this amount of air as a whole, the pressure is mostly going forward, out the straw, a little bit up and down, and very little backwards. This is a constant size. That's going to change, though. So what happens is you have a constriction, and that's going to cause a problem or a weirdness. You can think about it as a weirdness. So because it needs to flow at the same rate, like it has to have the same flow rate, the same amount of liquid or air or fluid or whatever you're blowing, needs to make it through that tube, but the size has changed, the speed has to increase. Because where is it going to go, right? So you've got all of this fluid moving, and if the size decreases, where does the rest of that fluid go? It's under pressure from behind to be pushed forward. Uh, so it can't just like wait, it can't be like a, you know, a traffic jam where things slow down because it's coming to a constriction. Instead, things have to speed up, um, which would be make traffic jams a lot, you know, more dangerous and, and less prevalent, I guess, if we all just sped up when the freeway got smaller. I don't know. There's a reason I'm not a civil engineer, so maybe don't listen to that. Anyway, so when the tube gets smaller, the speed is going to increase, which means the forward pressure is going to increase. If the forward pressure is increasing, that means the pressure in all the other directions is decreasing because it's got a proportional, uh, all the directions are proportional, right? They need to be in, in some sort of balance. So if this speed increases, there's going to be less speed going in all the other directions. Okay. So cool, now we've explained how there is more of a pressure forward and less of a pressure uh, up and down. You can start thinking about this right here if I had another straw. So let's say I've got my two straws. I'm blowing through this straw. This is going very fast. It's going faster than the non-moving pressure in here. As I blow across, it pushes the air going forward much faster, which reduces the pressure that that air exerts down into the straw. If we reduce the pressure that that air exerts down, then it starts moving up. So you blow across and the pressure is reduced down, then this starts moving up, and then when it reaches the top, it joins the stream that's flowing out forward. So you get air and water and whatever else you have at the bottom of your glass in the straw blowing out in the same direction that you're pushing the air with the straw. Okay. When the size of the tube gets bigger again, though, you have this weird... Um, that's not really weird. If the other one makes sense, this is going to make sense as well. It returns to the pressure that it was at back here. So if you have this size, then it gets smaller, the pressure increases, it goes back to the other size, the pressure decreases again. So what you end up with is you actually have 
more pressure here kind of pushing backwards. So if you had vocal folds or something right here, this pressure would be pushing back against them. In addition to that, this pressure is pulling vocal folds in. So you've got two parts of the Bernoulli principle uh, working to pull the vocal folds back together. So this stream is blowing really fast. It's sucking the vocal folds back into the airstream. And then here, past the constriction, so this would be like on your way up and out of the mouth. I mean, just right above the vocal folds, actually. Uh, the pressure is going to decrease because it's not as constricted, because it's not flowing through the vocal folds. You come out a little bit into the uh, vestibular area. And so then you've got more pressure pushing. Uh, you can't see me pointing at my... So you've got more pressure pushing backwards, which is then going to push the vocal folds together. So they're being sucked into the stream and they're being pushed backwards by the air pressure above the vocal folds. Okay, so you can think about this if you're trying to equate this diagram to what's going on in the larynx. Think about it like a person uh, laying down, I guess. So because this would be down towards the lungs, this is where the vocal folds are, this is uh, going towards out of the mouth, right? So they're going to have to be kind of like laying, no, that's the wrong way. They're going to have to be kind of laying this way. And you've got pressure down here. You've got constriction at the vocal folds. And then you've got just above in the vestibular area right here. So here's, um, I've changed the diagram a little bit to add something that kind of looks like vocal folds to it. So we've got back here a buildup of subglottal pressure, which we talked about in breathing. Um, so as that subglottal pressure comes this way, it forces them apart. Um, and then, like we talked about, the Bernoulli principle is going to suck the vocal folds back together and also kind of push back on them, which you can see here. This diagram is going to show the same thing. So you've got subglottal pressure here, which is going to force vocal folds apart. No, there we go. It's going to force vocal folds apart. Um, so you've got a smaller opening here than it was coming up towards the vocal fold. So then that's going to cause this pressure to increase and move faster, which then once you get on the other side of the vocal folds, you've got a little bit of a backward pressure and these are being sucked in towards that uh, high pressure stream right there. So hopefully that makes a little bit even more sense than uh, blowing green liquid at a whiteboard. Or the two of them together uh, are good. All right. Oh, before I end this, I did want to point this out too, that when this happens, so this cycle is going to repeat over and over, right? So you've got closed, open, closed, like that, open, closed, open, closed. And this is what happens as you're speaking. This is what creates uh, the puffs of air that then make sound pressure waves, right? So you've got increased pressure here. This is when the air is coming out between the vocal folds. And then here, the vocal folds have closed again. And then here they open, and here they close, and here they open, and here they close. And so then that creates this um, cyclic pressure wave, which flows through the air, it reaches your eardrum, and then it becomes a sound that you can perceive. It is also how all sound works. I don't know how far I'm going to go into this because it, I don't, you don't really need to know that, but there's a couple videos that I'll post of like uh, bassoon reeds. They've got, a bassoon uses two reeds, uh, which is a lot like having two vocal folds. Vocal folds are interesting because you can think about them um, vibrating in a way like a guitar string, but then also they're beating against one another, which is a lot like a double reed system. If you play an instrument with reeds, which is probably like one of you, so this is going to make sense to precisely one person, um, you put more pressure on it by biting on the reed, you know, harder or softer, and so that's going to 
like change how tightly those reeds are uh, pressing against one another. And that's kind of like changing how tightly the vocal folds are pressing against one another. But anyway, nothing is a perfect analog for the vocal folds because they're uh, interesting. They work in, you know, three uh, kind of different systems at once, which is why we have those really long named theories about what's actually going on. Um, the musical instruments, we kind of use one type of mechanism. Uh, it's easier to understand. It's easy for us to understand how a reed works, and so and we can create an instrument around it. But the vocal folds are a little bit more uh, sophisticated. Anyway, look for those videos, and I'm going to post a couple more about clinical issues, and then one that further shows you uh, the cricothyroid um, joint. <laughs>